Uh, we took a look last time at the world rejecting the Saviour. Now we're going to look at God's own people rejecting the Saviour. He came to his own and his own received him not. Um, and again, we want to see in that what it tells us about Jesus, because the whole series is about that, isn't it? Introducing Jesus. So what does the response of God's people to Jesus and Jesus' response to that uh, give us in terms of information about the person of Jesus himself? As I was saying to the children, it's one thing to be rejected by friends who don't want you to play with them. But once, when someone rejects you who's family, when someone rejects you, especially if you're a parent and you've nurtured them and you've brought them up and you've been through their woes and you've put up with all sorts of nonsense and hardships with them and then they say to your face, don't want you, get out of my life. That's really hard. And of course, many a human parent says, well, that's it, you're out of my will. Even within the church, I've come across that, where children have hurt parents so much that Christian parents have said, that's it, they're not my children anymore, and they actually have written them out of the will. Hard to think that a Christian parent would do that, but that's how far the hurt can go. And so when we take a look at uh, Israel, we want to see, well, what was the relationship Israel had to Jesus and to God? And then what effect would their responding to God's grace over all the years have had when that grace was rejected? Because when we read John 1, 11, we can read the words easily, and yet they are profound. Um, the Bible does remind us over and over again, our God is an emotional God. He has feelings. We can grieve the Holy Spirit, it tells us in, in the New Testament. Okay? And so in one, John, John 1, 11, it says, He came to that which was his own. So it's making a differentiation here with the world. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. So here's the true light of the world whom we've already identified as God, God in the flesh. All things were created by him, all things were created through him. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Everything has been created for him. And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We know Jesus is deity, we know Jesus is God. And then we read these words, he came to his own. Leon Morris, the commentator, points out something really interesting about that word own. It's used again in John 19, 27. You know that situation where Jesus is dying on the cross and he looks down and he sees his mother standing next to the disciple? And he says, here is your mother. In other words, giving responsibility for Mary to that disciple. Look after her, basically he's saying. And then it says in the text there, from that time on, this disciple took her into his own home. The word home there is exactly the same word for own in our text. He came to that which was his own. It's the same word in the original language. So in a sense, Morris says, we can say, the text is really saying, he came home. He came home. And his relatives didn't receive him. All along, God made it clear that Israel was special to him. That they had a unique relationship with him that the rest of the world didn't have. This goes way back to Exodus. Remember uh, Israel being gathered after the Exodus to Mount Sinai to meet with this God who had given them this wondrous victory over Pharaoh and his army. And what does the Lord say there? Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, hear that? Out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, 
you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Although everything is mine, the whole earth is mine. Of course it is, because God created it. Even though it's all mine, you, you will be for me a special people. You will be for me a holy nation. When we understand that, we can understand what God was saying. When through Moses, he was saying to Pharaoh, let my people go. There was a sense that the rest of the world weren't the people of God. He created them, they were made in his image, but there was only one nation that God ever declared, this is my people. Now you, Pharaoh, let my people go. And it's of these people, it says in John 1, 11, Jesus came home. Jesus came to his own. Of course, the link with Jesus is also clear in the promise made with regard to his birth. In Isaiah 7, 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel. Anyone remember what Emmanuel means? God with us. A virgin's going to conceive and bear a child, and, and the name given to him will be this, Emmanuel, and go back to the Gospels, and what do you discover? The other name given to Jesus is Emmanuel. God with us. There's that special bond also with regard to Jesus as the second person of the Trinity. And then finally, on this point in Romans 9, 4 to 5, Paul makes it unmistakably clear, this connection, this coming home with regard to Jesus. Speaking of the Jews, he says in Romans 9, 4 to 5, theirs is the adoption as sons, theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, that is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And listen to this. And from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ. And from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. Only from the Jews can the human ancestry of Christ be traced. So that's, that's the connection. When it says he came to his own this is the people it's talking about. There's a sense in which the world, it can be understood with regard to the world that it didn't recognize him. But there was one people on earth that should have recognized him. The Jews. They had these promises that had their eyes fixed on the future, waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah was an enormously important figure in their prophecies. When Jesus did arrive on the scene, many questions were asked, is this the one? They were waiting. Of all people on earth, they should have recognized him. Should it surprise us that they didn't? Already in Isaiah, God points to Israel and says they're more stupid than donkeys. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Would you like it if I said you're more stupid than a donkey? <laughs> but way back then in Isaiah's day, God was saying of Israel, they're more daft than a donkey. Listen to this. Isaiah 1 verses 2 and 3. Hear, O heavens, listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I read children. Listen to the connection. I read children. Do you remember the story of the father and the prodigal son? I read children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows his master, the donkey his owner's manger, but Israel does not know my people do not understand. Now we can read that passage and we can see the relationship, but also read the hurt. Read the pain of God. I read children. 
I love these kids. I brought them up. I rescued them out of Egypt. I showed them grace and love. And all they've done is rebelled against me. They're more stupid than a donkey. A donkey knows its own, uh, owner's manger. It knows where to find its food. But Israel doesn't know. Israel doesn't understand. You find the same situation with Jesus. Jesus speaks of that connection with Israel in uh, Matthew's Gospel. You get the woman who wants Jesus' attention and grace. And what does Jesus say to her? This is in Matthew 15, 24 to 26. He answered, I will send only to the lost sheep of Israel. I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And then the woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Jesus speaks of the connection. I came for the children. And I can't take their food and give it to you because you don't belong to the children. You don't belong to the family. You're not a Jew. Jesus speaks of this connection with the children. But what did those children do that had a connection with him? They rejected him. Remember his words in Matthew 11, 23, 24. And you, Capernaum, one of the Jewish towns, you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Can you imagine that? A town in which Jesus was present and Jesus did miracles. And they refused to believe. And what does Jesus say? Your response to me and your response to my work is such that if it had been done in Sodom, they would have repented long ago. They'd still exist today. But it's going to be worse for you on the day of judgment than it will be for Sodom. It's interesting that it's the same word used of Israel, or the same name, as in Isaiah 1. Remember I, I, I just referred to Isaiah 1 with regard to Israel being worse than a donkey? Listen to what God says, what name God uses of them in Isaiah 1.10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. There's a connection here. Jesus equates Capernaum with Sodom as God equated Israel with Sodom and Gomorrah back in, in Isaiah 1. Of all the people in the world, they should have known. But all along, God's people rejected him. And when Christ came, they rejected him. They received him, him not. And that word received is an intimate term also. It's not just a matter of saying, oh, g'day. And uh, you want to come and sit down and have a chat for a minute? <laughs> That's not the reception that's spoken of in terms of they received him not. The reception that they should have had for him was an intimate one. It's the same word used with regard to Joseph taking Mary into his home. He received her. He received her as his wife. And it says of the Jews using the same word, they received him not. They received him not. Like the prodigal, they wanted nothing to do with him. As, as far as I was concerned, he could die and they didn't care. And they proved it when they crucified him. How hurtful. How painful for God and for his Christ. What does it show us 
about God and Jesus. If we're going to be introducing Jesus to others, what do we show them out of this? We've already said last time, two weeks ago, in, from Romans 5.10, the amazing love of God is demonstrated in that even though Jesus knew what the world would do with him, even though Jesus knew the world would not recognise him and acknowledge him as being the creator that created it, he still left heaven. In Romans 5.10 we read, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So that's what we explored last time. This incredible love of Christ, that even though he knew the outcome, he still left the comforts and the peace and the joy of heaven and submitted himself to the crucifixion on the cross, where God's wrath was poured on him. Not for people who were crying out for help, but for people who would cry out, crucify him, crucify him. Here we have the true light coming into the world. And now to his own people. His purpose is in spite of knowing what they would do to him, that is, his own, knowing what they would do to him, he still has a plan, even to this day, to save the Jews. Not just the world, for God so loved the world, he gave his own, but he still has a plan to save the Jews. So we've seen how the world rejected him, and he hasn't come back yet because his, his so-called delay is his patience, not wanting anyone to perish, it says in 2 Peter 3. Well, he also still has a plan specifically for the Jews. In Romans 11, 25 to 27, which is the, the tail end of three chapters dealing with predestination and election. And at the end of it, it talks about the still favoured position of the Jews amongst God. And this is what it says in Romans 11, 25, 27. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them that I take away their sins. You know, there's all this talk there in chapter 11 about uh, unnatural branches being grafted in and the, the original branches being uh, cut off. And, and the point's made. Isn't it easier to take an original branch and graft it back in than an unnatural branch? So it will be that when the full number of the non-Jews has come in, God still has something to do with the Jews. As we'll see in a moment, we're going to explore this concept of great is thy faithfulness. He still has a place for them. As much as they've broken his heart, as much as they are the ones that crucified the, the Lord of glory, he still has a place in his heart for them and in his plan of salvation. This is why I've, I got Colin to read Lamentations chapter 3. Go back to chapter 1. It's hard reading, folks. Go back to chapter 1 and read through to chapter 3 and see how Israel rejects God and then see the judgment and the wrath that God pours down upon Israel. The book's called Lamentations. It's a lament. It's a dirge. The prophet is grieving because of what God is doing to his people. But why is he doing it? Because of their rejection of him. And yet the prophet says this in Lamentations 3, 31, 33. For men are not cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love 
for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of men. Yes, there is this hardening of heart by Israel, but the Lord is allowing it for a time. And then again he'll show his compassion. It reminded me of what I read long a time ago in 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13, when it struck me as being an odd thing, but in this context I understand it better. It says in 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13, Here's a trustworthy saying. In other words, you can count on this the saying. Okay? This is something you can really count on. Here's a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure, we'll also reign with him. If we disown him, he'll also disown us. And you certainly see that in Lamentations. And then it goes to say this. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful. Yes, he may disown us, and he did that Israel a number of times in its history, as he has done to this day. The full number of Gentiles have not yet been brought in. But if we are faithless, he will remain faithful. It's the image of the father of the prodigal son. The son was faithless, but the father remained faithful. And he embraced that son and welcomed him home when he came home. What do we learn about Jesus today? Knowing that he's own. Knowing that when he came home, they would not receive him, but crucify him. He still came. In spite of their faithlessness, he remained faithful to them. He knew his death on the cross and his resurrection were their only hope. And therefore he came to make them again his children. If you understand that, then you're in a better, a better place to understand Lamentations 3, 21, 23. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You see, the prophet didn't rest in the hope that Israel would improve itself and get on the right side of God. He knew that would never happen. But what he could bank on was the compassion and the faithfulness of God. This I call to mind. That's why I've got hope. Because of the, the Lord's great love, we're not consumed. His compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we give you thanks. That indeed in the face of Jesus, we understand you yourself even better. We thank you that Jesus, who being fully God, knowing what his own would do to him, still came to this earth, so at their hands he would be crucified. We want to acknowledge and confess this morning that we can't even begin to imagine what he felt in those three years when continually the people rejected him, when on many occasions they wanted to stone him, and eventually that they called out, that they wanted him crucified and Barabbas set free. We can't even begin to imagine what he felt as he hung there on the cross and they taunted him to come down if he were the son of God. And yet it was his love and faithfulness for those very same ones that caused him to remain on that cross, to go all the way to death in obedience to your, your command. And so, Lord, as we come before you this morning, we pray that you'll cause our love to grow and grow into a raging fire, that nothing can hold us back in wanting to make him known to others. Help us to realize we've nothing to be ashamed 
when we speak of the Lord Jesus Christ to those who don't know him. Help us, Lord, to speak of his great compassion, of his tremendous patience, of his unbounding love, and especially of his faithfulness in spite of our faithlessness. And by your grace, as we speak of it all, we pray that those who listen will have the blindness that is in their spiritual eyes taken away, that they may see him as he really is and declare him to be their Saviour and Lord. This we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.